All right, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 22. And if you remember up to this point, God has literally fulfilled all the promises with Abraham except for one. He has not given him all the land, but he has a son now. And it's by Sarah. She was a young, 99 years old. <laughs> or, 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 excuse me, she was actually a young, 90 years old. So I'm sorry, Sarah. Oh, forgive me. And, uh, yeah, 90, what's the difference? 90, 100, you know. And, and you know, and, and, but Abraham's really excited. And, uh, you know, he's got the, he's, this has been now, We've been reading his life and, and, and becoming a part of his life through the words. And it's like, this has been his heart's cry from day one with the Lord. To have a child with Sarah. And, you know, and here it is after all these years. Well, she was actually now at this point where we're going to be right start out tonight. She's about 100 years old. And Abraham is, is, is a little bit older because what, what we're going to find um, is that time has gone by. Ishmael was 13 years old when Isaac was born. And now we're going to find out, you know, uh, we find out the bondwoman was kicked out when he was, when Ishmael was a probably, Ish, not Ishmael, but Isaac was probably around two years old being weaned. And that's when they kicked out the bondswoman and, so Hagar and her son Ishmael left, and, and God said he would bless them, and they would be a, many nations. But we're, a time has passed now. Time, you know, sometimes we get to thinking, we read this in the Bible, and it, it doesn't give us every day. And then the next day he did this, and then the next day. What we get is what God's doing in the plan, and then it might be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years go by. Then the next thing comes up, and, w and we, if we don't stop to think about it. See, one of the things that you find that most people in the Sunday school classes, you know, for children, they have a little child that's now going to be taken up, and Abraham's going to offer this little child. Probably, if I had to guess, I would say this child is around 30 years old. This is not a young little baby boy which makes it yeah that makes it so much more interesting when you stop and you think about the submission that's going on here not only is God operating in Abraham's life but he's also operating in Isaac's life and is where we're going to pick this up but can you just I, I, I've got it we've got to try and understand this this child there is nothing in the world that Abraham wanted more. There's nothing he's been more pleased. If, if you'd have given him a new pony for Christmas, it wouldn't have made him happy. You know, this child is what he wanted all of his life. He's got it now. He's had this child for years. He, and this child is perfect in his eyes. This child is, is you know, I mean, healthy. And he's all, you know, going to carry the family name on. And everything is just... You know, as far as Abraham's concerned, blessed be the Lord God Almighty who just blesses people. And then we come to chapter 22. And it says, And it came to pass after these things that God did, and my Bible says tempt, but that's a poor translation. The translation should be test. He, came, he did test Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. Now, you know, as I hear that, then I think about Samuel, the Lord speaking to Samuel, and Samuel saying, yes, here am I, you know, and then I think about, you know, literally it's not the same words, but it's the same context of words that, that Mary would have said, here am I, behold, your handmaid, do to me, you know, whatever you will to do, and Abraham is, is that, it's that idea of, Lord, you speak, I'm available, what is it, and, and I, I love that. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. He says, And offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell you of. Excuse me, Lord? What did you say? Take my only beloved son, Isaac, and offer him back 
as a burnt offering, that's going to hurt. <laughs> yeah. You sure you didn't mean Ishmael? No, your only son, Isaac. You know, what is interesting to me, Abraham has grown to a point, he's not arguing with the Lord. Now he's, I, I bet you inside he was considering some questions, but knew better than to open his mouth at this point. Because he heard very clearly what the Lord had said. You know he does not understand it. First of all, God does not require human sacrifice. Why my beloved son? What could he have possibly done wrong? Well, I would suggest nothing. That's why he's being offered up. He's innocent. And you go, oh, oh, really? Yeah. You know what's really kind of interesting? Not that they were without sin, but there's two people in the Bible that no sin is mentioned of, of, of the patriarchs. Isaac's one of them. No sin mentioned. Doesn't mean he didn't have sin. We all know he did. It all comes short of the glory of God, you know. But it's not mentioned because there's a type and a shadow the Lord wants to see. He's typing and he's shadowing Jesus Christ himself. And the other one is Joseph. All right, who is a type and shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ. In both cases, no sin is, is represented, is shown to us in the Bible about them, though we know they did have. Okay, so Abraham gets this from the Lord. My first thought would be to what? I rebuke you, Satan. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, I, mean, would you, I mean, wouldn't that be your kind of, but he knows the voice of the Lord by now. He knows that he only has Isaac because of what the Lord has done in, he, in his and in Sarah's life. That Isaac is a product of God. Probably all children are a product of God, literally. But he even more so from, the, from what all it took in order for him to be conceived. So in verse 3 it says, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled the ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and he claved the wood for the burnt offering and he rose up and he went into the place which God had told him. Wow. The next morning? No question about it whatsoever. Now, you know, if the Lord would have said to him, Abraham, I want you to offer your son tomorrow morning right here, right now as a burnt offering. Do you know that would have been much easier? Because now for three days journey, he's going to have to, with every step, think about it. Test his heart. It's, it's real easy to be a hero in an instant of a moment. It's hard to be a hero and live that life. And think about it day in and day out. Every step he's going to take, he's going to have to picture in his mind what he's going to do and not understand it and question and at the same time, trust God. This is a trusting of God that very few people will ever in their lifetime arrive at. Few people. There, are, there has been in church history martyrs who have arrived at this place. I don't understand this. I know God loves me. I know he's a God of love. I know it's full of grace. But I can feel the heat, and it's coming. Do you know? I mean, that, that's trusting God even to the point of a horrible death. I think that in this case here, Abraham would have been far more willing to offer himself as a burnt offering than he was to offer Isaac as a burnt offering. Then it says in verse 4, On the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. He says, And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will yon go yonder and worship and come again unto you. Interesting. Okay, I, I believe they're, 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 they're at the bottom of the mountain. They're looking up. They might even be to the place of what we would call the Temple Mount today. The threshing floor. 
But I think they're looking up because I believe this all happened and took place at what we call Golgotha. At that place is where Jesus was to be crucified. This is a type and shadow, and I believe they're all the way to the top of the mountain. You don't see the ridge now because they've cut it out and quarried it in a temple mound and everything, but that used to be a ridge that just went all the way up to Golgotha. Okay, do notice that in the last of the fifth verse, it says, go up yonder and we will come again unto you. Abraham doesn't know how. He just knows this. God told him that through his seed, Isaac, there was going to be many nations. Well, Isaac has to be alive to do that. Dead people don't father children. Abraham doesn't understand the people of this you know the, all the logic of this world couldn't make you understand this how he's going to be a burnt sacrifice and yet he's going to father many nations after being a burnt sacrifice but you see abraham is at the point where he trusts god more than he trusts his own mind and logic and understanding he trusts god which is really a, a place to come to, what the Lord's trying to get us all to come to. In verse 6, Abraham took the word, wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. Now, when he laid the burnt wood upon Isaac, his son, it's a type and shadow. Remember that. Jesus carried the cross, the wood on his back, up to his own place to be sacrificed. And Isaac's carrying his wood. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. You know, so you could just imagine Isaac. Now, remember, he's not the little child. Uh, he's of an age. That, see, I think it's typing in shadow because in order to go into the priesthood, Jesus had to be 30 years old, according to Levitical law, to be entered into the priesthood. And so I, I think that probably it's somewhere between 30 and 33 years old. Jesus would have been sacrificed in his 33rd year on the cross. And so, you know, somewhere right in that period of time he's but just the point is he's not a little child and remember his dad is very old now his dad is probably 130 years old well two things to make note of one is surely his son could have overtaken him the other thing to note is i don't know this man's 130 years old climbing a mountain <laughs> you know uh that's something to think about, you know. <laughs> it had been a burnt offering, all right, but it would probably been me if I had tried climbing that mountain. In 7 it says, And Isaac spoke unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Same way he answered the Lord. Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. That's interesting because it depends on how, where you, you put a comma, where you pause, to what that, you know, or the meaning of that. God's going to provide himself. Or he's going to go buy one and bring it here. Or he's going to provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. Now, Isaac accepted that. You know, it's been three days in the hot sun across that dry land. Now they're climbing a mountain. He's carrying the wood. He's got the fire. He's got the knife. And he believes his father says God's going to provide the sacrifice. Okay, let's go. And they came to the place which God had told them. This is verse 9. And Abraham built an altar there. Now, when you build an altar unto the Lord, what does he require that altar to be? Out of stones with no carvings and dirt. God does not want beautiful, what we think are beautiful, carved altars. He wants what he created. Because you know what? They're prettier than what we can make. They're nicer and it's part of it. I just think that's, that's interesting, but Abraham built an altar. Now, I'm sure Isaac must have helped, but Abraham's building this altar, and, and he said he laid the wood in order, and he bound Isaac. Can you imagine when he starts to bind Isaac? Isaac's going, uh, 
what's going on, Dad? <laughs> no, we don't. We, because we live in a very liberal Western United States and in 2012, we don't understand this kind of obedience. But this is the kind of obedience that they had in those families back then, where people if, if did what they were told to do by the senior in the family, especially one listening to the Lord. So he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Was there any doubt in his mind what he was going to do? Knowing that he wasn't going to die or he would be resurrected from, the, uh, from death because God is the one that's in charge of this and watching. You know, he can't see God. It, God isn't standing there. God isn't talking to him. Okay, it'll be all right, Abraham. Go ahead. It'll be okay. Nothing. This is silence. Sometimes God tells us to do things, and then he quits talking to us. And we get there, and we go, are you sure? Are, are you sure we're supposed to be out here in the wilderness doing this? Are you sure? <laughs> and the Lord doesn't say anything. He told you what to do. You know, I, some, one time somebody said to me, well, we don't practice this certain thing out of the New Testament because it was only spoken once in there by the Lord. And it wasn't practiced by the apostles and, and by the disciples. So we don't, we don't do that. And I thought, how many times has God got to tell you before you do that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Once is sufficient with the Lord. Now, because of his grace and long-suffering and mercy, he tells us in many ways, various ways, diverse ways, dreams, and, you know, he does everything. He even sent his son to tell us. But once should be enough, right? I mean, when God speaks, once should be enough. And in verse 11, he says, As he took this knife and he went to do it. He says, the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven. Sure, good thing that Abraham's not hard of hearing. <laughs> yeah, out of heaven. Didn't even come down to the earth to stand there right next to him and stop him. Just calls him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything to him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son from me. Did God know Abraham's heart? Absolutely. Who did he want to know his heart? Abraham to know his own heart. Not only that, but for us, through this story, to understand the power of God to change our hearts in this world, right in the midst of all the crud, all the junk, all the Sodoms and all the Gomorrahs and all of the kings and their armies and life and nephews and family problems and lot and you know the whole thing right in the middle of all of that stuff and then you're lying and giving away your wife a couple times you know God has changed this man's heart to totally believe and trust him doesn't that give us a little hope that maybe in the midst of all of this time he can work with us and change our hearts wouldn't you like to have a heart like that? Now, as I read that story, people are going, oh, don't, oh, oh, don't, you know, this is horrible. This is hard. Well, I got news for you. It's only in the hard things you know the depths of your heart. See, if God would have said, oh, I want you to pay 50 bucks. Abraham, David, I don't know. Would you take 45? No. <laughs> but this is the ultimate. And you get into the New Testament, and the Lord starts talking about that you have to love him more than you love your father, your mother, your sister, your brothers, your children, everything you own. And, and to Peter, do you love these fishes more than you love me? I mean, you know, everything that, could possibly be the Lord's going to say do you love them more than me or if I asked you to give them up whatever the most 
prized thing in your life. And it may not be children with us. Some of us have children put our shoes under the bed and you got another one coming. You know, and, and you got you got so this wouldn't be I mean we love our children, but this wouldn't be the desire to, of, of our hearts that God has led you through. And and I see God doing this with certain people throughout the Bible where he would keep the wife barren for a long time until they just they they literally with every morsel or, or every bit of strength in their body, they're crying out to the Lord for a child. And then he gives them one. And then, but it's sometimes in our life, it's different things. Maybe with us, it, it might be a, a career. It might be a job. It might be a talent that we want. And the Lord will finally give us that. And what's the first thing he's going to do? Ask for it back. Because you see, he isn't going to give you something that is going to take your love for him away. That's why he never, people go, well, gosh, doesn't God, he's got a thousand cattle on a, on a, on a thousand hills, you know, and I mean more cattle, every one of them belongs to him. How come I'm struggling so much financially? You know, some people think that. A and they would, and I would just say to you, because you're not at a place God could bless you. Because if you were, possibly with you, finances is more important. Maybe it's uh, health. Why does some Christians not have perfect health all the time? See, because it, it, that may be more important to them. The Lord's testing. It's always a test of everything that he has blessed us with. There'll always be a test because you, you know what? In the very end, when you leave this world, when you transfer out of this body, and we all will, the only thing you will take with you is your love for the Lord. Was it number one? Or was it number two? Did you love something else more? See, that's going to be the question when we get to heaven. God isn't going to question Abraham about Isaac when he gets to heaven. It's, bec it's, it's the question of, did you love me first? See, no matter what it is, God's not going to ask you, how did you do with your family? Did you get a house for him? Did you get this? Did you, did you pay the money every month to, to provide food for him? Those won't be the questions. The question the Lord's interested in is, was I the one you went to for the house, the food, the money? The, do you understand? Do you, did you realize that I was the provider for all those things? And did you give me, you know, did you give me the just uh, reward or, or, or uh, the, did you bless me for doing those things in your life? You know, God knows what we need down here and he knows what we're made out of. But he's seeking our hearts. He gave us a heart with a free will in it. And what God wants is you to give that heart back to him. Then everything else... Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Then all these things shall be added unto you correctly. You get those things first before the seeking of the Lord. They're not correct. And they're not a blessing. They'll be a hindrance in your life. You would, you, I know now, and I want you to know, you wouldn't withhold your son, your only son from me. In verse 13 it says, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and beheld behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Oh, lucky thing, right? Isaac probably went, oh, whew. Well, I was nervous there for a while. Have, can you imagine a ram, a wild ram, caught by his horns in the thicket right next to him, just can't get away? Why, that doesn't even make sense. I mean, these animals live in thickets, run through them. Have you ever seen an elk run through, through brush? Uh, and they have these huge horns. I can't even walk through it, and they run through it and don't snag their horns and hook up on it. I can't imagine a ram. See, it's definitely... I, I wonder, this brush, this thicket it was caught in, was that kind of like the burning bush? Was that, <laughs> you know, who was holding this ram? And Abraham went and he took the ram and he offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. I'll bet you the first part of that offering ceremony was silent and was deliberate and 
probably slow. But I'll bet the second part of that offering with the ram was with happy and a song in his heart and just he was tickled to death to offer this ram instead of his son. But the point was he was willing to offer his son. Now what's the type and shadow of this? Well, we'll find out that later on there's a father in heaven that will take his son and not withhold the put name to death. And Abraham's son wasn't perfect. We don't read about anything, but he wasn't perfect. But father in heaven's son, his son, was perfect. Never disappointed him. Never did not please him completely. Never was not obedient to him immediately. And he went ahead and offered him for me and for you in our place. I, I can't hardly imagine him offering his son, and especially the second part of that is for me. Doesn't, that doesn't make sense, just like it didn't make sense to Abraham walking towards that mountain, what he was going to have to do. It doesn't make sense to me. God could have created a race of humans that was just perfect and stayed perfect. Then he wouldn't have had to offer his son. All he would have had to do is get rid of Satan and have him never come to the garden. And Adam and Eve would have never been tempted. And they would have been perfect. But there would always been that question. If they were tempted, would they have failed? Could somebody talk them into... Not loving me, not believing in me, not trusting in me. And God, being God, knowing the future, said, yeah, they certainly could. I'm going to uh, I'm gonna have to devise a way to redeem them. But I'm so holy, and my justice in me won't let me do anything else. Let's see, to be disobedient to me... There is absolutely nothing in the world that will pay that except, and he looked at his son, he said, if you'll go and die in their place. That's it. Can you imagine his son saying, if that's your will, sure. Just like Isaac said to Abraham, if that's your will, sure. Wow, that's a heavy Type and shadow. That's probably uh, the heaviest thing. And, and it's what everybody that doesn't want to believe in the Bible and doesn't want to believe in God uses. Oh, well, that God you worship, he requires human sacrifice. He was going to have, you know, Abraham kill his son Isaac. What kind of God is that? Well, the kind that would send his own son in to die in our place. That's what kind that he is. 14, it says, Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. It is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Oh, there's lots of songs, Jehovah Jireh. Yeah, God provides. In verse 15, it says, The angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. The angel of the Lord. When you see that in the Old Testament, and it specifically says the angel or the messenger of the Lord, more than likely, this is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. And first, you know, he calls him. I, every time I hear this, I, I have to stop and think about it. Out of heaven. Do you know how far heaven is away? No, you don't. I don't either. But it's not in the realm that we see with our eyes because we can look through telescopes and see a long, 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 long ways away, right? With what we can see with our eyes in this physical realm that we live in. But if God was way out there beyond what the Hubble he telescope could see and, and out of heaven this angel goes, Abraham, Abraham, how long would it take to get here? Isaac would be very old laying on that wood before, you understand? It must be right here then. Out of heaven, 
Ah, another dimension. That's something I always think about is the Lord. He doesn't have to leave heaven and come here because heaven is here. In a, another, it's got to be in another dimension. We know there's a spiritual dimension out there. What, how far away is that spiritual dimension? I, I, we don't know. We don't have any idea. I know that it took uh, Gabriel 21 days because he was held up by Satan to get an answer to, da to Daniel. 21 days. Does that mean it's 21 days journey, light years away? No, not necessarily because I know that Jesus, when he rose from the grave, he took his sacrifice and he told Mary, don't touch me now for I must take this offering unto the Father. And he does that and he's back that afternoon walking with Cleus and his friend on the road to Emmaus. So it couldn't be too far away. <laughs> the other difference, isn't it? I have to always stop and think, though, when I hear this. The angel of the Lord calls out from heaven the second time in 16 and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. Oh, wait a minute. This is the angel of the Lord, and this is what he's saying. By, by myself I have sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. Who's speaking? The angel of the Lord. Isn't that interesting? Pretty well got to know is this is a deity, is he not? Okay. He says that in verse 17, In blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed, as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the sea shore, and thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. One act of obedience and listen to this the rewards of that in verse 19 it says so abraham returned to his young men and they rose up and went together to beersheba and abraham dwelt in beersheba wait a minute something's wrong with this verse where's isaac very interesting because right after the blessing you're not going to read or hear about isaac anymore until his bride comes. It's still part of the same type and shadow going on, isn't it? The son, it, see, it, it didn't stop with just the God the Father be willing to send his son and not withhold and to have him die in my place, but there's far more. The type and shadow is going on because there's a bride of Christ being created, and not only do I not have to go to hell and pay for my sins, I get to go with him and enjoy life with him in all the riches and glory of heaven. That's the type and shadow, the bride coming to the son. We'll see that played out here. So in verse 19, it was Abraham went by himself back down to Beersheba with the two men. And 20, it says, and it came to pass. Now, do I believe Isaac was along? Yes, I do. But for the story's sake, for us to see this, but I don't think Isaac stayed up on the mountain by himself. Maybe Abraham forgot to untie him. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. He's old. He could No, he didn't. Verse 20. And it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, she has also borne children unto thy brother Nahor. It says, Huz is firstborn, and Buzz his brother. Now, I like these guys a whole lot better than a lot of names. You know, <laughs> Huz and Buzz. Okay. And Camuel, he says, the father of Aram. He says, and Chezed, and, and Hazel, he says, and, and Phildash, and Jidlap, he says, Bethiel, he says, and, and Bethiel begot Rebekah. These eight Milcah did bear to Nabor, Abraham's brother. So, why are we getting all this story? Well, because we're going to find out there's going to have to be a wife. Remember we read in the uh, chapters before that he sent his servant who was a type and shadow of the Holy Spirit, and, and back early where you learned his name was Eliezer, but he sent him to find a bride. Someone in the family, oh, in the family, type and shadow, must be born again. Somebody who's willing to leave where they're at, never having seen the groom, but be willing to give up everything to come and be with the groom. Like maybe the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. That's the type and shadow of that. 
we're getting now the genealogy of, of where Rebecca comes from. And 24, he says, And his concubine, whose name was Rumah, she bore also Teha, he says, and Gema, and, and Tabash, and Mekalah. Now, if you want to hear me mispronounce any more of those, I'd be happy to do so. Okay, chapter 23. We're going to have to finish up with Sarah now. Now, remember, Sarah is like, at, at 90 years old, yeah, at 90 years old, became like a new woman. A new womb. New life out of her womb. She bore a child. She was able to, to nurse this child. You know, she's raised this child. She weaned this. I mean, this is an elderly lady. But she's a little different anyway because at 86 years old, Abraham was afraid they would kill him because she was so beautiful. And sure enough, the, the king took her into his harem. So this is no ordinary lady. Okay. But now we're going to read about her end. He says, And Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. 127 years old. These were the years in life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kajar Rabbah. He says, The same of is Her uh, Hebron, he says, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and wept for her. You know what's interesting about this? Sarah is the only woman in the Bible that we're told about her birth and her death. Her age at death. All the other women? No. Men, yes. Women, no. But Sarah, we're told, it's an honor. An honor given to her. Why? She represents, it's a, I don't know how to really even put this in words. She represents the deadness of the tomb and then new life coming from it as Jesus rose and new life of the, uh, and a body of Christ for all of us that changing place of the power of the Holy Spirit to bring forth life into a new body and to be the bride of Christ. She represents that. She's the, she's the, the she was, Abraham couldn't bring forth holy seed until he had a holy place to bring it forth in. And she represents that. She's like, it, it's, a, it's an honor given to her. Is she special? Was she a sinner? Does she need to be saved? Absolutely. But it's an honor given like Mary was in the New Testament who brought forth Jesus. But it, 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 life was brought forth in there by the Father. But, uh, you know, it's an honor. But does it make her a special woman? That, no, she still needs saved. She's a sinner just like everybody else. And so was Sarah. But what an honor to be the only woman that ever in the Bible that God lists her death. Isn't that interesting? I, I love that. And verse 3, it says, And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spoke unto the sons of Heth, saying, He says, I'm a stranger and a sojourner with you. Isn't that interesting? He stood at his old age and whatever, one of the richest men probably in the whole land, and he's a sojourner. He says, Give me a possession for a burying place with you. He says, That I might bury my dead out of my sight. He says, And the children of Heth answered Abraham and said unto him, Hear us, my Lord. Thou art a mighty prince amongst us. He says, In the choice of our sepulchres, bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulcher. He says, But thou mayest bury thy dead. So they were saying, In the places we bury our dead, you go ahead and bury yours there. We won't withhold any of the graveyards, any of the cemeteries, or anything for you. But let's stop and think for a moment. Abraham wants to bury Sarah and get, and get her out of his sight. She's her body, one of the things, he gives respect to it, but one of what Abraham knows that Sarah is going, he's, she's already in the house that God's building for him. Do you know that, I mean, that, that he's going to? I mean, she's, she's going because there's, it's like when a Christian dies now and I have to do a funeral. It's great. Not that they're dead. It's great. I know where they went. And they're already there. And they're out of this pain and misery. And their testing times is over. And all their times 
in order to fail is gone and whatever. It's a lot easier. What's really hard is when I have to do a funeral for somebody I'm not sure about. Or even worse yet, somebody I am sure about and is not going to heaven. And, you know, but Abraham, Sarah had her time on the earth. She passed it. She did what the Lord wanted to do. She was a part of the Lord's plan here on the earth. Now she gets to go and reap for eternity the submission she did in obedience to the word of the Lord. And in her life, the obedience was very obvious. But for us to leave here and to go to what we look forward to, the Bema Seat reward time, to be, you know, to get our good works, the rewards for that and whatever, don't you, or, or, or do we kind of hope that they're as obvious as Sarah's were? I mean, at, at her age to bring forth a child, 90 years old to bring a child into this world, and to love it, and to be, I mean, the obedience was so obvious. But so is our good works. We, if we're obedient to just do what the Lord asks us to do, He'll, there's been good works, but it says before the foundations of the world, these have been done for us or set aside for us to do. And they'll be just as good. And we'll know then when we go to heaven, we were obedient. And the people, if we do our good works, you know, like, like James says, you know, show me your faith and I'll show you my faith by my works. If we have those works and they're not, that's not our purpose in life to do the works. Our purpose in life is to minister to the Lord and worship him. But if we do the works, Everybody around is happier when we go, aren't they? It, it's for the ones that don't, we're not sure of. And we're, yeah, I think they were a Christian, you know, they owned the Bible. You know, we're not sure, well, then we're not really happy about that. And with Abraham, he wanted to just, it's over, it's settled, let's get this done. You know, and he wanted to buy his place. Also, what's kind of interesting about this is that, This is a cave, and this cave has an opening at one end and goes through and opens and comes out the other end. They, they, ha they know where this cave's at in Hebron, and it's kind of an interesting thing because you go in it in the flesh. It, this is the type and shadow that you go in it in the flesh, and your flesh stays there, and you go on out the other end in the spirit. Do you, do you understand? It's like the Valley of Achor. Now, with... with uh, um, oh, what, gosh, what, I can't, it, it, Achan, when Achan stole the stuff, you know, that he wasn't supposed to touch, and they ended up, they caught him, and they ended up, the Lord had him buried at the, at the beginning of the Valley of Achor, and a heap of stones was put on it, that was a cursed thing. Later, we find out the Valley of Achor is the Valley of Hope, because if we'll let our sins be buried at the beginning then we go through the valley. Yea, I walk through the shadow of the valley of death with you. We walk through that valley and leave our sins buried in the, under the stones in the tomb with Jesus. We come out. It's a hope for the other end for eternal life. See, what looked like to be the curse turned out to be the blessing. And Abraham, I, I want you to see that Abraham is seeing this cave kind of that way with, with her and he's seeing that way in his life and we need to see it as a type and a shadow you, I guarantee you, you're not going to leave this earth with this body understand that just get over it it's, it's going to it's whether it comes you know through natural causes through accidental causes or even through the rapture you're not leaving this body you're not taking this body with you to heaven you're getting a new one because this one Paul will tell us sin lies within the flesh this is where, this is it. we're leaving this behind. So don't get too attached to it. In verse 7, And Abraham stood up and he bowed himself in the people of the land, even to the children of Heth. Which is kind of interesting. Because these are, these are Philistines. You know, they're, they're, uh, they're Canaanite uh, descendants. And, and uh, you know, you, go, you look at this and you go, He's bowing himself to them? Yeah, the things of this land. And he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat me to Ephron, he says, the son of Zohar, he says, that he may give to me the cave of Mechphalah. He says, which he has, which is at the end of the field, for as much money as it is worth, he shall give it to me as a possession of a burying place amongst you. You know, I notice that it, it's not just the cave. 
It's the field, and at the end of the field is a cave. What's the type and shadow of that? What's the field? Remember the parable? And, and, and the man that found a great treasure in the field, and he went and sold all that he had that he could buy the whole field? The field is life. It, it's the humanity life here, and, and it represents that. And what's at the, at the end of that life for every one of us? A cave. We're going to go through it, but some take the left cave tunnel down and some take the right. I mean, you know, it just, it, 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 some go up, some go down. You know what I mean? But it's like with all of us, it's the field of life. And, and your, your whole life, you're going to be accountable for it. Everything from the day of accountability, wherever that was in your life, you know, and, and for some children that might be as young as, I don't know, 12, 13 years old, where they know good and, you know, the accountability of life. For some of us, it might be 35 or 40, you know. But here, I, you know, whatever it is in your life, from that day forward, every word, thought, action, you're going to be accountable for it. Every word out of your mouth. And you're going to be questioned on it. Unless... It's all been erased. Think about that. How does it get erased? There's only one eraser in all of eternity, and that's the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Washed white as snow, clean. Records wiped clean. Why? Because they're already paid for. God is a fair, just, honest God, and he, you can't be held for double, double jeopardy. You cannot become accountable for one sin twice. If the sin was paid for and it was accepted, you can't be held for that again. And we even have that in our own court systems, don't we? You know, so it's absolute with God. So make sure that you have got before the Lord and got his eraser out, confess your sins, and he's faithful and just. <laughs> Some of us. <laughs> Lots of sins. Got a big eraser, though. And, and when you get up there, all those things you would have been held accountable for, they're not there. And what are you held now? Oh, wait a minute, but look at what he did for us. We asked him to do. Here's the blessings. Here's the good works. Oh, bless him, bless him, bless him. Not judge him. It's a judgment, but it'll be judgment for good. You won't be afraid to go to the principal's office when you're called then. Okay? But Abraham says here, he wants his field, and at the end of the field is the tunnel. And 10, it says, and Ephron, he says, he dwelt amongst the children of Heth. And Ephron, he's the Hittite, answered Abraham. He says, in the audience of the children of Heth, even in all that went into the gate of his city, saying, Nay, my Lord, hear me, the field give I thee, and the cave that is herein I give to thee in the presence of the sons of my people, I give it to thee, bury thy dead. Free gift. I, am not, I won't take your money for it. Now, is that really true? No, that's the way of these. We don't understand that. Here in America, we went, oh, good, thanks. And he went, <laughs> see, that's not the way it is over there. Oh, you can have it. I give it to you. It's probably worth a quarter of a million dollars, but you can just have it. Oh, I couldn't take it for nothing. Nothing. Here, let me give you the quarter of a million. Oh, no, but if you insist. See? You better, yeah, you better, you know, because he'll tell you what he wants for it in the middle. But, but it's like, another thing, note here too, Abraham's what, a, a sojourner? Don't be indebted to this world then. If you want to be indebted somewhere, be indebted to their Father in heaven. Not this world. Gosh, I, but I, I live down here. Can't I just... Play the game like everybody else down here? Well, I don't think so. You're a sojourner. You're not of this world. We all live under different standards. Verse 12, it says, And Abraham bowed himself before the people of the land, and he spoke to Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, But if thou wilt give it, 
I pray thee, hear me. I will give thee money for the field. Take it of me, and I will bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, saying unto him, My Lord, hearken unto me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your, your dead there. And Abraham hearkened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out to Ephron the silver, 400 shekels. He says that he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth 400 shekels of silver. That was the current money, he says, with the merchant. And the field of Ephron, which was in Mechala, he says, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave, which is therein, and all the trees that were in the field that were on all the borders round about were made sure. Wait a minute. What did I just read in here we hadn't read before? And all the trees that were in the field? Oh, wow. Wait a minute. If we're typing in shadow this, this got to happen. I mean, it was brought up. Didn't have to tell us if there was trees in the field. Why do you think it said there was trees in the field? Oh, maybe you're to pick up your cross, your tree, and follow the Lord. You see, when Jesus said, die to self, pick up your cross, and follow me. He was headed to, at that point to go and die on the cross. He's telling us if we're going to follow him. No, that's okay, Lord, go ahead. I'll pick you up right after the crucifixion. I want to be a king's kid. I'm going to join up with you right after you die on that cross and pay for my sins. Then I'll join up. That's not how it works. You got to go through the cave. You got to get your tree, your cross, go through the cave and follow him. Die to self. That's where the dying is at is in the cave. You come out the other end, spiritual. See, people think they can join the church and everything's okay with God and they're going to get to heaven and everything's okay. And that's not true. Nowhere in your Bible does it say that's okay. It says that you must join Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. It doesn't say, and you can just join him in his resurrection and get everything, all the rewards. I mean, we'd really all like that, wouldn't we? That'd be like learning to play the, the flute and not have to practice. You know, there's we must baptism is the is the is the example that's why it's given to everyone as the first commandment after of obedience to be baptized with christ down in the water representing death to leave your sins in in christ and then the resurrection the newness of life out of that water into a newness of life filled with the holy spirit that's the type and that's the shadow of what has to happen to us spiritually. You have to come to the cross in repentance, in, 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 where you're ready to repent of your sins. Go ahead. You can ask it now. It, oh, the question was asked, what about all the people that have just been sprinkled instead of whatever? You know, God, Moses baptized the whole nation of Israel and they never even got wet, even with a sprinkle. It has nothing to do with the water. It has to do with the, the attitude of the heart. Do you, do you understand that? God's not interested in our flesh. He's not interested. I mean, not, I'm not saying not interested, but that's not our, our eternal is not our flesh, and he could care less whether it gets wet or not. I like dunking because it shows more the type and shadow of exactly what's happening and it and in most time. If I had somebody who was in a, a sick bed and couldn't get up and whatever else, I would sprinkle them in a moment. If I had somebody that was absolutely allergic to water, I would baptize them dry. It has to do with the heart. It has nothing to do with the water. Okay? Is, everybody got that? All right. So we'll go on. Verse 18. 
Unto Abraham, he says, for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth before all that went in at the gate of the city. And after this, and just make note of this. Who owns this land? Well, the Philistines owned it. No, they don't. What did God give, give to Abraham? Because God really owns all the land, doesn't he? Didn't he give to Abraham from Egypt? To the great river Euphrates? I got news for you. Hebron isn't even hardly a beginning of the trip to the great river Euphrates. It's in there. This all belongs to Abraham already. Why did he buy it? From the people of the land at the time. To have as much peace as possible with the people while you're in the land. But it already belonged to him. Oh, wait a minute, what's the type and shadow of that? I'm a great type and shadow guy. I love type and shadows. Does God already own you? Absolutely. Life. He's the life that lit all men. John 1, 1. That comes into the world, right? He already owns you. But he died to buy you back again from sin. Wait a minute, he already owns you. Yeah, I know. But he paid the price again to pay off everything that you owed. Your indebtedness. Abraham buys back the land. Who gave him the money? The Lord made him rich. Remember that? Multiplied him time and time over again. You know, fact is, the people of the land got so worried about him. Remember, Abimelech comes up and wants to make a treaty with him because he's so, God is multiplying him so much in their land. You know, why when God... God gives us something, and he tells us to give it away. Why do we hesitate doing that? He tells us to bless somebody with something. He gave it to us. Why don't we just do it? 19. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah. It's a good thing this didn't take weeks. <laughs> he buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of uh, Mechali says before memory, he says, the same is Hebron in the land of Canaan. By the way, her grave's still there. And the field, and many others are in the grave. We'll see that as we go through too, in that same cave. And the field and the cave that is therein was made sure unto Abraham for a possession of a burying place by the sons of Heth. Now that's really interesting. Wait a minute. Ab God already gave it to Abraham. He bought it back then. And then through a period of time, the nation of Israel will be kicked out of Israel. In 1948, they come back. Do you know when they came back and it was given to them land, that the, that the Israeli people bought back the land again from the people that were there and were, and were on the land? The nation of Israel has been buying back land. Their own land. You're going to see even, uh, even when we get to Jeremiah, God's going to have Jeremiah buy a piece of land back too as a type and a shadow. You see, it, it's kind of, uh, it's it just to me, it's interesting. God has us do something. We could just stand on his word. Abraham could have said, hey, you guys, I own all this land. By the way, you owe me rent because God gave it to me. And I want you to pay the rent or God's going to kick you off. Well, that's really what happens later, right? You know, I mean, God does. Kicks them off the land later on. Takes them and puts them someplace else like Shoal. <laughs> but the thing of it is, is that God sometimes will have us do things that just, for instance, in the New Testament, Peter gets into a conversation with a Pharisee about paying temple tax. Jesus wasn't going to pay the temple tax. Why? Well, he says, does the, does the king re take taxes from his own son? No. Not from his own family. The other people, the outside people, the ones that are taxed. And the Lord Jesus is going, but Peter sees how you did. You go catch the fish with the money in his mouth. Okay, and he, and he pays it. But he does pay it. But, but Jesus is God. Why would he have to pay tax in his own temple? See, I... But he did. Jesus paid the temple tax. Because why? He said, give unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. That temple was pretty well all Caesar's by that time. Why is that? The high priest said, 
as they were trying to get Jesus crucified, said, we have no king except Caesar. Did they not say that? Okay. I, we need to understand. Sometimes you, you, God will have you, and, and you just got to kind of live within the, the bounds of it. You know, the things that goes on here on this earth. But I want us to see the, the type and shadow of this whole thing, the, the burying place. I, I think it's something that we've got to see and we've got to understand. You're, you're going to go in the cave, but when you come out the other side, the choices you made while you were on this side in the field will determine your eternal life. And you, Sarah did not get to take anything with her. She didn't even get to take her son that she loved so much. She never took all of her wealth. She never took anything. She just went into the cave and her flesh stayed there along with all of the possessions stay on this side of the cave. What can you take to the other side of the cave? Ah, your love for the Lord and all that you're willing to do to serve him and to make him happy with you. That's the only thing you can take to the other side of the cave. Your eternal life De it depends on your your decisions why you're over here now in this earth but doesn't it seem and to be all fair fair about the whole thing is it seems like it's so hard to even think about eternal life over here because everything's so demanding we need to do this and we need to do that and pay this and pay that and and be here and be there. And we have to do, you know, our job requires this much of our mental time and, and our physical time being there. And, and have you ever noticed there's just never enough? But also have you noticed you're still here after all those years of never enough? It's the, it's the, the flesh is always, it says, is like fire. How much fuel can you throw on a fire that's finally satisfied and it quits wanting more? See, yet Paul said, I'm content. Where do we find that contentment? Because it, until you find to be that place of contentment, you're going to find it really difficult to give time, money, and everything else the, about you to the Lord until you find that contentment you will find that in the cave at death they're content now <laughs> but we need to find it now and I think Abraham found that before he ever got up on that mountain to sacrifice his son I think that's all of a sudden one thing that he realized when he got up there the same thing that Job said that he found. Blessed be the Lord that giveth and blessed be the Lord that taketh away. Job didn't finish it, what happened in his life, because he didn't know for sure it was going to happen. But he should have said, and then blessed be the Lord that giveth again. He giveth the child Abraham. He took it away. For three days, Abraham, that child was as good as dead. And then he gave it back to him. I wonder which side of that burnt offering scene Abraham was more thrilled with his son. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for these words and for these stories. And Father, I just really pray that we take these things to heart. You said in, in, that you wrote these things down from these people that for our examples that we might understand your ways, Lord. So, Father, I thank you for that and I pray, God, now that the Holy Spirit would take this story that we've heard in our ears and put it into our hearts, Lord, and let us understand the deeper meanings of these things. We pray and we ask, God, that you would just bless us with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless.